think about sort of what you could be doing wrong, not to scare you or anything, but that's, that's <laughs> part of it. No, not but at all. But the most important part of it, a lot of people forget that part, um, but the most important part of it is that it does give you exclusive use. So is a trademark a business name or a logo? It could be anything. A trademark could be, let me think, if I say this goes with that, who am I talking about? Suzanne's. Oh, what I a feeling. I don't there, I know. <laughs> oh, what a feeling. They're both registered trademarks and they're slogans. Um, you can register an element of packaging. Um, you can register a shape. I'll show you my shoes. <laughs> what sort of shoes have I got on? Does anybody know? Otherwise, I'll ask Bridget. <laughs> campers. They're campers. Now, camper is very, very clever, okay? I know that Witness rips off campers all the time and sells them for a quarter of the price. <laughs> but they're not as good, for one. But how do I know that they're not campers? Is that they don't have the little red... And I'll take my shoe off to show you. <laughs> they don't have had a panelist that little sure. red... <laughs> see that little red tag there? That's registered. Okay, the pictures on the sole of that camper, mine are pretty uh, old, but um, <laughs> they've even gone as far as to register the sole of the shoe. They've registered, they, they got cut sick on the trademarking, but they've registered their box. Now, a box won't pass the test. Now, when I say, I'll oh, go off and register your trademarks, it's not as easy as all that. Um, there's specific rules. Um, that apply as to whether or not you will get it. But, for example, Camper trademarked their box. Now, not just the box, because the box is functional. So if they just tried to register a box, it would have been rejected. But it was a brown box with a red lid, with Camper splashed across the top of it, with ridges in the box, um, and all of that sort of thing. So you can think about if you're um, selling perfume and you've come up with a brilliant bottle, um, you could trademark that bottle shape. Um, you can trademark colour. So if I bring you an orange bottle of champagne, who am I talking about? Okay, where are the alcohols? You guys don't drink room? champagne. <laughs> Verve Clicko. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, Verve was able to register the orange colour of their bottle. So that right. means no one else can have an orange so bottle. And no one else can have an orange bottle but for champagne. They could have an orange bottle for perfume because when you register a trademark, you register it in different classes. There are a number of classes of goods and services um, where you will get trademark registration. So when, when do we first can even consider registering a trademark? Do we do it when we're first starting the business or do we wait till yeah. we've evolved? Oh, I immediately and more immediately. and more people are doing it. Um, when you go to your... If you're getting advice in relation to your brand, it's at that stage where probably all at the same time you should go off and see your lawyer um, and get some preliminary advice as to um, whether or not that the suggested branding would potentially pass all of those tests. So I'll give you um, an example of some of the tests is that if you've come up with a brand name and it is deceptively similar to another trademark that's already registered, it's not going to pass the test. But more simple things than that, if it includes um, words that are laudatory, so for example, perfect or excellent or things like that, it's unlikely to get um, okay. registered. I've got um, clients that do um, signs for blind people and they're known in the industry as Braille Tactile Signs, and they wanted to register the trademark Braille Tactile Signs Australia. They, did, they got rejected initially because that um, business name actually just basically tells everybody, it's descriptive, tells yeah. everybody what the product is. It's not the actual name of so the business. So it's not distinct enough. Okay. Yeah, it's not distinct enough. Right? So it needs to be capable, a trademark needs to be capable of distinguishing your goods and services from the goods and services of other traders. That's the legal definition of it. Yep. Um, but there's a number of rules um, that your trademark would need to satisfy to be able to get registered. So do we first start with registering the business name, then checking the trademarks available? Check the trademark URLs. first. Okay. Check the trademark register first. Yep. Then, and there's a um, website to then go to? 
Beg your pardon? There's a website yep, where you IP, can go to. www.ipaustralia.gov.au. I wouldn't... I'd, I'd see if I could spend a little bit of money, and this is to save later, because you can imagine how much it'll cost to rebrand. Yep. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. is to probably get your searches done professionally. Now, you don't need to get a lawyer to do it, but what a lawyer can do is do searches and then give you a written recommendation as to which classes you should register in um, and all of that sort of thing. And you need to be a little bit strategic with that in terms of you might be doing clothing today, but you might want to launch into shampoos and conditioners tomorrow. So why would you go and register in class 25 when in a year's time you might want to register in class 3 for shampoos, right? Um, and then all of a sudden somebody else has taken it or something similar. So there are different classes There's for different, different industries There's different classes for and different products. industries and products. Okay. So you need to be doing those searches while you're developing your brand and yep. before you've even fine-tuned... Um, your logos and things like that because, I mean, ideally you want to get your name trademarked but sometimes your name on its own won't pass. So you might need to jig up that name with a logo and logify it so that it becomes a badge of origin. I think I made up that word, yeah. logify. <laughs> it's all right, Shakespeare um, good made lawyer. up words. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so then it becomes a badge so what we're talking about with trademarking is developing badges of origin, right? So you might have um, the Braille tactile signs people finally got their trademark registered because they developed it. We sent them off um, to a to a um, their their business coach actually sent them off to a branding consultant um, who developed the brand, um, and they were people that had done it themselves as well. Um, and what they've done in the end is that they've registered a lovely logo with a big dot that represents the sort of braille dot, but it has braille tactile signs Australia written on it, but they've developed the logo so that it's got BTS in the form of a big B on that dot. Now, that's very, very distinctive. It's using great colours. They've come up with a slogan, your wayfinding specialists at the bottom of it. Um, so their competitors are not going to be able to use braille tactile signs because it's all part and parcel of that logo. Yep. Because if somebody's about to breach, it's enough that they're breaching an essential element of your trademark. So in terms of what kind of costs are we looking at for to a trademark? To register. Yep. Um, if you're looking at legal fees aside, search fees aside, is that um, you're looking at, for Australia... Um, it's $160 per mark per class, if you do it online, application fee. Once it's been accepted, then you're looking at $250 registration fee per mark per class. Once we go to international stuff, then you're looking at big bucks. Um, but there's some horror stories to tell as to why you would want to spend those big bucks as well. Okay, got one? Do you want play? a story? <laughs> 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 you can, um, for international trademark registration, you can do it from Australia now, which is great, um, because there's an international treaty called the Madrid Protocol. Um, and the Three Rivers Wine example is a great one. Um, Lenny T-shirts is another one. Lenny um, was about to embark on massive export venture and had not registered the trademark Lenny overseas, hadn't even looked into it, um, had to change their name to St Lenny. If you go onto the website now, it's St Lenny. Um, so they had to spend a whole heap of time and money sort of rebranding that. Um, why you... And that's the reason you should trademark overseas. But to register overseas, there's an international treaty now that... Um, a number of countries have ratified, which allows you... You used to have to go off and trademark um, your trademarks in each individual country that you were going to go into. Um, now what you're allowed to do is, because of the Madrid Protocol, is that you can apply from Australia to any number of those countries that are under that... that have ratified that convention. Um, you can pay in Australian dollars. Um, all the paperwork comes back through Australia and stuff like that. So that's a lot easier. The thing is, it does cost a fortune. Now, for example, I had a client that spent $20,000 registering in three countries, but in eight classes. 
Okay. And it was a couple of trademarks. Now, the norm would be, say, if you wanted to do the EU and the US, which is sort of the main, the first export countries that people go to, um, then you might be looking at for one trademark in, say, one class in those two countries, maybe you're looking at $5,000, okay? Now, if... Why would you spend that five grand? Um, my clients were... They're quite successful in outdoor lifestyle accessories and some of their products are bags. They do a lot of carry bags and things like that. They dropped five grand on an Emirates ticket to fly to a German trade expo. Um, they got to the German trade expo, very excited, had meetings lined up um, to get some distribution deals done over in Europe. Um, and two stalls down from their stall was a German company with the same name as them. Okay. That German company had their trademark registered in the EU, slapped them with a threat of an injunction. I got a phone call at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Linda, oh my God, oh my God, what do we do? Um, we had to get ourselves out of it without admitting liability and all of that sort of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, they spent the five days of that trade show with their brand covered up. Okay. Suffice yep. to say, uh, no exporting for that client to date. So we really need to look at the, the future That's of the right. business. You need to have a big and... picture vision. Yep. So when you're developing your brand, don't just think, oh, I'm small pickings today. I work with a lot of small pickings that within six months are exporting globally. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, I need to trademark in France and I need to trademark in South America and all the rest of it. Um, and sometimes they can't. Sometimes they've got to rejig their names totally and things like that. And you've got to think, what is my market going to be? It might be Melbourne today, but it, it might be elsewhere as well. And like I said before, it might be one product today, but it might be services and other products tomorrow yeah. as well. Okay, now the topic of copywriting. How is copywriting different from trademarking? A lot of my clients come up to me and say, oh, how do I register my copyright? You don't register your copyright. The copyright is the protection of an expression of an idea. So if I'm a, a painter and I paint a picture, then copyright in that rests in me the minute that I the minute put that out that. there. Okay? okay. Um, if I write a book, then the copyright's in there the minute I put it out there. But the thing is, I mean, to fight somebody copying that yep. um, is a big, long, arduous process because there isn't a registration process as there is for trademarks. Um, to take that to court's pretty hard. So what um, the suggestion is to clients a lot of the time in terms of that copyright is that you put it out there to the world that you're claiming the copyright. So put your little C's in the year and your name on everything. Yep. Yep. Um, and also think about this is an important thing, I suppose, and I've got designers and consultants and all the rest of it next to me. But um, once, your, once your brand's developed, for example, you've got to ensure that the copyright in that, the thing is that copyright belongs to Tash because she's developed it. So you need to be ensuring that you get an assignment of copyright from designers, but not only from designers. If you're um, in anybody in training services or something like that here, not yet. So if you're in services and you're developing manuals, operations manuals, a lot of my franchisors have big fat operations manuals that they've spent years developing. Um, if they've got a contractor that comes and works for them, and this is a little bit apart from branding and, and, and things like that, but they've got a contractor on board, not their employee, but a contractor, an independent contractor that's been brought in to write a section of that manual. Now, unless they get an assignment of copyright from that contractor, or at least in that contractor's